Joining me on Decent Cities today is Jason Warnke, who is the head of global digital experience at Accenture. Welcome, sir. Thanks for having me. Good to see you again. Great to see you. So how many employees does Accenture have now? We are in the 700,000 plus, which is just mind boggling. I just can't, when I say it, I have to think about it first because it's just extraordinary. Um, global, uh, we, have, we have people all over the world. Uh, here in Tampa Bay, we have, uh, I think we're somewhere between 800 and 1,000 people right now. Tampa Bay, for us, goes all the way across uh, to Orlando and back. So we think of the corridor and then the Tampa Bay area that we know. Uh, so we have, uh, in fact, we were just talking, our original office was right across the street here in downtown St. Pete. Uh, so we love this area. I've been, uh, I was a USF grad, so I've been here for a long, long time, and I love Tampa Bay. And uh, it's, it's cool to have uh, our, our folks here uh, contributing on the local scene, but also globally. Uh, and I think we're going to talk about some of those cool things today. We definitely are. Um, and, uh, you know, Accenture is a huge company. We know it's consulting. Can Just for folks who know the name and know it's consulting, but don't know sort of the major work lines, can you give us a brief overview of Absolutely. what Accenture is? So traditional um, IT consulting and, and uh, you know, major implementation work, but also over the years, uh, we've diversified into uh, digital agencies. And, and I think at the, at the moment, we're the world's largest digital agency. We've uh, acquired a bunch of uh, uh, really um, iconic uh, digital agencies like uh, Fjord and Droga5 and, and companies like this and brought them into uh, Accenture Interactive. That's the part that's uh, doing all that fascinating digital agency work. Then we also have Accenture Operations that does big uh, global business process outsourcing and things like that. And we obviously have uh, change management and technology consulting and, um, and everything in between. It's really uh, in even what we call Industry X, which is uh, all of the digital manufacturing uh, types of work that we do, which is fascinating. So there isn't a job function that's out there in the world today that somehow somewhere inside of Accenture uh, doesn't exist, which we find uh, just fascinating. So it's a very diversified company, like I said, global uh, with all kinds of industries and, and all kinds of functions that uh, that work across business lines. So pretty fascinating. And with so many people spread, you know, essentially what is a, you know, a nicely populated city of worth of people spread all over the place doing all sorts of jobs, keeping a cohesive, uh, uh, you know, energy and theme and, and, and employee experience is, is no small task. And and you've been very innovative in using a metaverse experience to do that. Can you talk a little bit about the platform? Sure. Uh, one of the things that uh, we always felt, even uh, you know, five plus years ago, is as distributed as we were, uh, you worked with people every day in your local city, whether you're at a client site or you're in an Accenture office. And although you may work with folks around the globe, you were on phone calls with them, and then as time went on, you were on uh, Teams calls or Zoom calls with them. And uh, you, you sort of felt like, okay, I know there's a global organization out there somewhere. I meet people, I'm on calls every once in a while with folks uh, or, or daily, but the broader culture that we are uh, wasn't really felt because um, it's the happenstance sort of meetups that you could do when you have everyone on one single campus wasn't really there. So we were always sort of looking for a way to make sure that people felt the global nature of us and the culture that we are, culture of cultures is often used, um, but we don't had, we didn't really have that mechanism to bring people to a virtual place where they would, outside of a meeting, right? Meetings are one thing, but outside of a meeting, get together, run into them. So we always said like, there's gotta be a way to do it. And years ago, this is now five years ago or so, we said, I wonder what the next version of collaboration is, but more immersive. And we were experimenting in those days with with virtual reality, mixed reality. And, it, you know, early days of it, you know, we're, we're pretty rough. And, um, but just enough, to, you could sort of see a glimmer of like, I, this could be a thing someday when the headsets get better and the technology gets better. But as time went on, and then during COVID, when we really were not able to get together on, on campuses or at offices, we really felt the need uh, to propel the, the, you know, community building that we do inside of Accenture across, uh, across the world. And especially when we bring new people into Accenture, how do you get them immersed in the culture of Accenture and everything that we do and the types of businesses and industries that we serve? And we just couldn't do it the way that we used to do it. We, we used to be able to bring people to a physical location for a week or, or several 
to really get them acquainted with what we're all about. We couldn't do that anymore that way. So the the early days of the metaverse, and at the time we just called it sort of virtual reality collaboration, it, you know, opened up to us, and we started to use as an experiment these uh, these headsets for onboarding our people, and we really saw a, a pretty extraordinary thing happen, which is um, people having that same sort of deep engagement, learning the culture and the, the understanding of the people that they're working with and the parts of the world that our people are in, but then having this much deeper recollection of what they learned and how they learned it with the people they learned it with in this more immersive way. And we said, there's there's something there. So we decided to go really big. We we purchased 60,000 Oculus 2 headsets, um, uh, Quest headsets, and we went out and um, and started to really drive the onboarding process in a new way where the entire onboarding process doesn't happen in the headsets. It's a portion of it. So, you, you know, if you've been in a quest before, you know that it's something you might be able to handle for 30 to maybe 60 minutes. But uh, so we, we have a portion of the onboarding experience that, that uses that. And then the rest of it's more traditional means. But we think this is not just something that we're doing because we're in the current state that we are in the world, but we think this is something that will continue. And this idea of an omni-connected experience where you're using different devices and different modalities to connect with people, some will be in person. Uh, there's great, I was in our office today in, in North St. Pete, and someone that is on my team that I've worked with on, on teams, you know, over the last several years, the conversation that we had just in a chance encounter over literally around the coffee machine, um, it, it sounds so, uh, you know, so trite, but it, it, it was the deepest conversation that it's just, you just wouldn't do and don't do on, on traditional web conferencing tools. So, we think that that combination, free, you know, flowing between in-person uh, teams calls and then virtual reality, um, is is something that's just part of the, the the future of the way that will work. And obviously, as the headsets get uh, lighter and they get to be where they're more like almost traditional glasses or augmented reality glasses that can sort of move between augmented and virtual reality, we think that people are going to flow uh, freely between those different modalities. So. I think there's something here. I, I was I was optimistic early, but I still had that like, yeah, I, but it probably is one of these things that's like, yeah, we're doing it, but it's not really compelling. It's now have has gotten to the point where people are like, okay, the next meeting we're doing this way and here's why we're doing it that way. Um, it's really sticking and uh, we, we love to see it. And we love to see what people are doing with it. It's fantastic. And what I what I like about it is, you know, a lot of times solutions uh, are lesser than experience that are sort of a necessary utility, can't meet in person, so we right. go to Zoom, and Zoom has some great aspects to it, but sure. people would say it's not the experience of being able to, you know, have people, hear people on your left, hear people on your right, and look around and, and sort of be in this space. And so this unlocks that, but that in and of itself was never available on a global scale. And so you're now able to connect Accenture employees through this metaverse or immersive experience in a way that was never available. And therefore it's a, an actually a better thing versus just a, you know, a, a lesser than thing as a utility. That's right. And the thing that I really encourage our teams to do is as we design the environments, you know, the natural reaction uh, or, or inclination is to recreate the world that we know. So like, oh, let's create a digital twin of our office, the exact office. And we did that, and that's really cool. And we, we have that for different use cases, like helping to design offices. But when we're talking about like going into a virtual space together to have a meeting, why create it in the world that we know that has gravity, that has you know all the trappings that, that are required in a normal office setting? Why not create something uh, otherworldly? And that's what I think is amazing about sort of the crossover between entertainment and the, the world of work, because the same technologies uh, that are used to create Game of Thrones and all these amazing uh, shows and movies that we watch uh, can be used to create and the environments that we'll engage in in the future of work and collaboration. Uh, never before could you do that. You could design an office, really expensive office, that looked like the interior of some movie scene uh, so that you could have those. And, and plenty of examples across, you know, the Googles of the world create these spectacular uh, workplaces. but. Now you've unlocked this whole world of uh, fantasy land, if you want to uh, call it that, to create uh, amazing environments, to do things that you can't do in today. So I always encourage the team, yes, we could create the office, the environment to look like our office. Think about what it could be if you just like 
completely went out there and, and created something magical. Yeah, that is, and that is a very important point. I mean, you, you now open up, uh, you know, completely new ways to be creative, to, to express yourself, uh, and to create structure around how things flow, um, probably ends up as a whole new, uh, in position in, in large companies, which is that, you know, that uh, unlocking employee power through doing that or a whole new field of, of, uh, of services. So do you have, as you know, digging into that, do you have any sort of early examples of, of how that might express itself or ideas that people have had uh, to, of how people would interact in this, this sort of no rules way? Yeah. And, and I think one of the things that uh, if, if we go to a regular, a real use case that happens every day, like brainstorming as a group, so in, you know, over the, over the past several years, people have had to adapt from, I used to get into a room that had whiteboards and sticky notes, and we used to do brainstorming, you did design thinking with the, with the sticky notes, and you'd go through a whole process, and you got used to the way that happened, and then all of a sudden, you know, the past several years have happened, we've had to adapt that into the 2D world over uh, Teams calls, and that's, you can do similar things, but it's definitely not the same as being in a room together with, with uh, individuals. Well, as you, then as you think about what's next and you go into brainstorming sorts of design thinking examples in the virtual world, why design that same process to happen the way that you did it in a room? Yes, it's great to do it in the room because you can you tac, you know, with tactile uh, you know, engagement with drawing your ideas on paper, putting them on the wall, arranging them, prioritizing. But imagine if now you've unlocked this whole uh, next level way to collaborate and brainstorm where there's three dimension and there's things that could float in the room together and there's ways that you could uh, you know, uh, create a product uh, together all around the world. And, and I think that unlocking what brainstorming could happen next is just sort of on the early uh, front. We're on the early frontier of that. And I think the technologies that will uh, be next will allow people to unlock ideas and, and brainstorm in, in ways they couldn't in the past. And so that's just one example of where I think technology, uh, the, the metaverse technology is like, yes, you know, uh, embodying an avatar, going into a virtual space that might be magical, whimsical, and have that sort of immersive, you know, spatial audio and video is, is neat. But then like, okay, what, what can you do with that to solve a problem better than you could in the past? And that's where I think, you know, getting people to say, let's break all the rules that existed in the past. Even physic, physics problems is, is uh, such a neat thing to think about. Yeah. And when you have, you know, I think of all the options for like rapid pro prototyping right. where you could have tools that have, you know, co coded in the physical characteristics, put them together together. You know, let them work together, see what happens, or tweak some of those physical characteristics and see what happens. Right, and uh, you know, uh, and then you know, translate that to the real world. So a lot of endless possibilities, really. Exactly. So with all of that, um, you know, sort of understanding of what could be, how how are you feeling about the timing of it? Right, we we still have the big kind of clunky glasses. There's, right, it's still mostly uh, in the realm of games. You know, the yep. immersive stuff. So. Um, is it, you know, are you, are you hoping there'll be an acceleration in, in these sorts of tools for the, the professional space and, and what, what role can Accenture play in right. making that happen? I believe this is going to happen faster than we might imagine. It is happens, you know, in early prototyping and experimentation, you know, the overall experience to me has felt like it's taken much longer, but what, what has happened is people have started to experience now, and there's so much focus on on this topic, you know, good or bad, it's really gotten people into their first experience. And as soon as someone has the first experience, then all the way up to the very top of, of organizations are seeing the value. It's now propelling the industry forward because the demand and the use cases are very real, whether it's uh, virtual selling, uh, selling products that are really high end products that are really complicated to sell in traditional forms, um, where it's just, it doesn't scale to have, you know, um, physical shops where you're trying to explain, like even a car, uh, selling a car wasn't, it's not always possible to have the right sort of uh, experience salesperson that can talk about a physical product that is fairly complex, like an EV, selling an EV today. You know, consumers have lots of questions. Tesla puts these stores uh, in expensive malls and it's a great experience, but that doesn't scale tremendously. Uh, you can buy your car completely online, click, 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 and you know, it's coming, but there are some deep questions that folks have as they're, you know, considering the move from a traditional vehicle to an EV. 
that sort of use case, um, I think, is, and, and as the leaders and businesses see that, and they see how that could happen, and how approachable it is now, is going to really propel the industry to, um, you know, to scale the tech, both on the software side, but then on the hardware side as well, because um, I think in the past, it was viewed as a gaming thing. It was like, okay, yeah, those are fun. But now as uh, business leaders are seeing the impact that these can have in business, it's really propelling the hardware manufacturers to, to think about how they can create products that scale across geographies. Because it's one thing to sell, um, you know, the headsets here in, uh, you know, a ge geography like the U.S. and in Europe at the price point that they are. But that doesn't scale across the globe, um, and the products need to, you know, to, to be affordable in all geographies so that everyone can appreciate and uh, participate in in this new world. So I think it's going to happen a lot quicker than people might imagine. At at right at the pace we're going at right now, um, I think it's realistic for us to imagine in two to five years um, both the hardware you know, gets cheaper and smaller and um, more approachable because it's still, you know, even though they're getting cheaper, they're still, if you haven't used them before, they're not as approachable, right? It's not something you would you hand your parents and say, hey, or just figure it out, like phones have become. Um, but certainly within the next two to five years, I think they become cheaper, more approachable, more affordable across the globe and the software that supports them and the creation of the content that goes goes in these things uh, gets easier and more approachable. I think you, were, you and I were talking uh, recently about, you know, what happened in web development, right? It, it went from something that you had to learn HTML, and then all of a sudden, and it happened fairly quickly, things like Squarespace and Wix and these things became really simple to spin up a website in minutes. And, um, you know, right now it's really not uh, approachable to create these virtual worlds or avatars or whatever, and it won't be long until it is where you just say, hey, I want to create a world. And, and you know, uh, Meta is doing this now with their Horizons uh, Creator Lab, I think it's called, where you can go in and, you know, create your own world just by kind of like a Minecraft sort of thing where you, you, you build the world and then invite others to participate in it. That'll get easier and easier. So I think it's going to happen uh, pretty quickly. And when you think about in the scale of everything happening in the world, two to five years, for it to be, I think, really approachable and affordable is is going to be uh, here before you know it. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Um, one sort of nuts and bolts question that uh, is less glamorous, but I know you have to deal with it, and that's the regulatory environment. Uh, you know, we have even state by state, there's specific HR laws and things like that. So now when you bring everybody up into this borderless virtual campus, you know, what are some of the challenges or opportunities or what sort of that... Uh, you know, what have you had to pay attention to with, with bringing people together? Yeah, I think um, one of the things we knew would happen in a new disruptive te technology is that the rules and the approaches we've used in the past uh, would need to be reexamined. And this is something that, because we're early days, there, there aren't yet um, really enterprise-grade uh, solutions on the software and the hardware side. And that is another area that is evolving very quickly. Uh, so that means like in our purchase of these uh, headsets, they're consumer headsets. And we've had to work through in certain geographies uh, offering that sort of headset and the terms of use for that, that type of headset and the account that you've had to create uh, to use that. We've had to, you know, select the geographies to start with and, and will evolve over time, both as the hardware and the software better account for and handle enterprise uh, sort of solutions, but also as the you know uh, laws and regulations in different uh, states and countries, uh, geographies uh, change as well. It's it's something that's disrupting the entire uh, world. And as people understand it more and they get into it, they understand the implications and the risks. Um, you know, the content moderation that's hap that happens today on social platforms. You know, it's taken years to get that to a point where you know I think we feel relatively uh, confident that content moderation uh, keeps people safe. But now we're entering a whole next arena where people go into these. And, and you know, a, a similar thing has happened in online gaming, right? You go into games and certainly, um, you know, you can run into some bad situations. And I think the same thing is, is now on the forefront here in, in the metaverse world, which is we have to think about 
how do we keep folks safe um, in the virtual worlds that they go into so that they want to continue to do it. It's an inclusive uh, place and, um, and no harm is done, right? But it, it, is, um, it is definitely something that we've had to uh, work hard to figure out how we, how we step into this in a big way, in the right way, in the right geographies. To, to learn from it. And I think the industry is learning as a whole as we as this whole thing evolves. Yeah. Perhaps a problem solved by by global standards and, and opt-in sorts right. of things or organizations that uh, you know provide guidance on those things versus uh, you know control and laws just because exactly. they're unenforceable to some extent. That's right. Yeah. So uh, let's finish up by talking about the year ahead for you. Uh, you know, you've come this far with what you know and all that you know with building this virtual campus experience. Uh, what's the next year hold as far as pushing that forward or other projects that you're working yeah, on? Yeah, one of the, and as we sit here in your awesome video studio, one of the next frontiers that we're experimenting with, which I think is going to be so exciting, is 3D immersive uh, capture so that you can put a real human, instead of an avatar going into a virtual space and people watching an avatar on stage, you know, bringing a live 3D immersive human into a, uh, a virtual space. And so, we're experimenting with uh, several uh, platforms now that do that. And, and the tech, again, technology there, right now you gotta get really expensive rigs and software, and, you know, and it, it's difficult to do, but that will get uh, cheaper and easier to do where just a simple, you know, like DSLRs will come with the capability to do it and stream it that way into a virtual space. But right now it's sort of very nascent. And so we're, um, we have a, a bunch of TV studios around the globe. TV is a, or video is a great way for, to communicate with our people, and it has been for years. But we think the next frontier is, um, you know, using virtual studios, virtual sets, and virtual um, immersive capture, putting them into the virtual space is going to be super cool. Yeah, that is awesome. I could see uh, once they become more ubiquitous, uh, you know, even houses, three bedrooms, two baths, one studio, right? <laughs> exactly. Be. Well, you know, I love I love that you have the opportunity to to do to be so innovative inside such a big company. It really speaks to Accenture that that they're you know pushing pushing other people through this cutting edge stuff, and you know, it speaks to the culture. Um, it is sounds like a pretty cool job too. I would say it's a blast. Yeah, uh, it's always good catching up, and I appreciate you sharing uh, what you've been working on, and we'll look forward to catching up again uh, during the next couple leaps. Awesome, thanks, Joe. Thanks uh, for having me.